Hey everybody, welcome and thanks so much for joining us. On today's episode of Convention On, Ryan and I sit down and chat with Mr. Rick Jordan. Rick is first and foremost a cybersecurity expert. He also hosts a podcast called All In, and he's a best-selling author. As described, Rick is a pretty dynamic guy. Today's day-to-day consists of traveling around much of the nation, enhancing security measures, motivational speaking. He's pretty busy. As usual, though, we're not here to talk a ton about his day-to-day now as much as how he got here. In order to achieve this level of success, Rick had to stumble a couple of times. He fell, had some things taken away from him, and saw some opportunities ultimately disappear. What stands out, though, is his refusal to stay down. Rick is the epitome of a one foot in front of the other kind of guy. That, combined with his faith and his refusal to turn down any opportunity, has led him to where he is today, which is a place where he's ultimately enjoying the fruits of his labor and his success. Sit back, everybody. I think you're going to find this a really interesting conversation between Rick, myself, and Ryan. Rick Jordan on Convention on Faith Maverick. How about that? The on button. That's <laughs> I crazy. Bumped it and it, you're right. I bumped it and it turned it off somehow. <laughs> Is that too loud? I ended up turning it no, all the good. way up before. Never okay, buy come. microphones with a switch. It's my model. I know. I know. <laughs> like... I didn't even, I'm the switch and then the LED on the switch doesn't work anymore. So I, I know, never yep. know. I'm tapping away yep. on it. This right on. A, I think, Rick, we are, we're very fortunate. So bear with me here. I'm going to try to introduce you, but I'm going to let you introduce your, yourself a bit more Fun. accurately. You've got a, sure. you've got a lengthy bio, my friend. Um, yeah. <laughs> we are, we're very, we need to condense very, the world. <laughs> Very grateful to have uh, Mr. Rick Jordan with us today on Convention Not. Um, Rick, like I just kind of indicated, Rick has a diverse background, but uh, we're going to be talking with Rick today. I mean, he, he's a cybersecurity expert. Um, he's a motivational coach. Um, he's a handsome fella, too. I'm, I'm just getting what, to know him you. right now. So, uh, he's got a sport Rick, coat on. I know. I that's what I said. Like, man, I need to go. I need to go dress it up a little bit. I'm glad I yeah. put a shirt on today. It's uh, <laughs> say so I could say I could take whatever off. You know. <laughs> I said we'll get there. We may get yeah, there. We'll you get never there. know. Might. You yep. never know. Rick, Rick, would you be so kind to maybe give yourself a bit more uh, adequate of an introduction, just so our guests know who we're hearing from today? You're good. I was telling my team we need to like condense the bio that sends for these things a little bit. There was a dude, oh my gosh, it was a, I can't remember what show I was on, but he read it word for word. you know. And, I, and after that, I was like, wow. And then, so we came up with the term. I'm like, you just got Rickrolled, you know, instead of Steve Rolled. <laughs> 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 it was it was pretty crazy and i'm listening to this i'm like yeah this is great you know how so, you have you spoken on stage ever oh uh, yeah yeah it's you know when somebody introduces you you know they start to go through all this stuff especially if you're a keynote speaker they, they really want to pump you up to the crowd because it's like so great that you were there for them you know mm-hmm. so when that happens I, I always hear this i'm like god i hate hearing this stuff over and over again it is an incredibly <laughs> awkward situation right a little bit yeah but, you know i have no issues talking about myself mm-hmm. you know in, in that sense but that's good you know anybody should be, feel comfortable and confident enough to talk about themselves you know like, like just yesterday right I, when i was saying i flew back i'll get to my intro here in a bit you know but yeah, just yeah, just yesterday i was at the white house yesterday yeah, you know, right. advising some national security people on cybersecurity. And it, it was it was a fantastic time, you know, really grateful because there's a lot of cool things that are coming out of it, some fun projects and all that. But as I'm with there with the team that I went with, you know, they're like, dude, you ready? You ready? You ready? And I'm like, I don't know. I'm like, I, yeah, of course I'm ready. I'm ready for any room. That's cool. And, and I got the question, you know, do you feel insufficient? And I said, you know what? In a way, Yes. I feel insufficient. I feel sufficient in what I know, but I feel insufficient in who I am. Uh, th- that was my mindset going into this. I'm like, but I can't think that way because I think back to 12 years ago, dude, to before anything, like when I was broke, you know, had my twins were born, I was laid off, couldn't pay my mortgage. And how That's far quite a question from 
like is this the person who's prepping you to go into a meeting at the White House? I'm yeah. sorry to I'm sorry to interrupt. Oh, no, he no, asked you if you felt insufficient. Someone who I was there with because it, it was okay. It was okay, project. yeah. Somebody who knows you a little Somebody more personally. Me. Yeah, exactly. Okay, I'm so sorry to interrupt no, you. I good, just man. you know in like the <laughs> like political context of today that I just feel like that would have been an, a unique way to set you up to walk in to do your work there. Yeah, um, right. It's such a cool place, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's an interesting place. It's a very it's so much busyness there too, man. It's it's mm-hmm. fantastic. Everybody is, I was really impressed with the work ethic. I mean, the, you know, regardless, and I don't know if this is an administration thing or whatever it is, you know, I mean, you've heard back in the days and you compare like the Republicans to the Democrats, you know, and most Republicans, they show them in the suits, right? And then the Democrats like Obama, Clinton, they show them that they were a little bit more laid back of an office environment, you know? So it was interesting. So I don't know if it was just because it's a Republican administration right now, you know, th- this is by n- far not a partisan statement at all. But I was really, really impressed at the drive that everyone had. And even though, even though, you know, the election's coming up, they were still working on things as if they were going to still be there for the next four years. Sure. Uh, it That's- was really, I was really impressed that way, man. You know, there was no talk of the election, no nothing, but they were just pushing things forward. Because at this point, with any project that started in government, you know, how is it going to possibly get into place before the election? It's not going to be. You know, so they're doing programs right now, literally just for the benefit of the country. That yeah. part was really cool to me, walking into that scenario. But how well, yeah, because what there, do you what do you do? Stop in year three and just prep, you know, for a whole year for the election. Well, yeah. Like we, the ball, the wheel <laughs> needs to keep turning, right? At exactly. least theoretically, you, it does. You hear the term like lame duck, right? You know, and it, usually that's at the end of somebody's term when they can't be elected anymore. You know, and that's yep. when everyone pardons everybody from a president's perspective. Like, <laughs> doesn't matter anymore. I'm not getting reelected. I've served my two terms. I'm <laughs> like this this murderer go free for the rest of his yep. life. You know. <laughs> I was really impressed, though, you know, because it didn't matter the polls right now. It's just everyone kept pushing forward as if they were just going to be there for the next four years. That was impressive. But as I walked in the room, like, you know, being feeling insufficient in who I am, you know, but it was like a culmination, man, being asked to give my expertise and my perspective in order to drive this project forward that really is for the benefit of our country. And so when, I, when you talk about my bio... You know, it's like, wow, I look back at all the stuff that I've done, right? You know, I, I speak nationwide. I've spoken at NASDAQ, Harvard, West Point Military Academy. That was a trip. I was there speaking on leadership at an event there. <laughs> and it, you know, I, I go on ABC, NBC, CBS, Fox, you know, if you want to count CW and all the other smaller networks too, that's fine. All over the country. I, I wrote a book on ethics, you know, and all the while I've also been a semi-pro musician, you know, as a pastor in, in the church. And that was for 15 years, man. And, and, you know, all this stuff that I've done is like kind of culminating right now. So I kind of gave you my bio in, in, in what I just said, but it's no, really like cool that. because nothing, even though at certain times in my life, I thought a lot of that stuff was for just for vain, you know, meaning because there were bad experiences that came out of some of the things that I did, <laughs> you know, just, uh, you know, being mentally abused in a church aspect by even pastors and talking with with bosses and everything and how, you know, they, they pummel you because it's very political. And a lot of people really are, are just out for themselves or to protect themselves and in, in whatever scenario they're in usually comes down to money, you know, but I look back at everything that I've been through, man, and this diversity of experiences in my life and everything is really starting to culminate. It's like the planets are starting to align and none of this stuff I forced to happen. I just said, yes, you know, and I always say that it's like, just say, unless it's a moral or ethical gut check, just freaking say yes and do it. You never know what's going to come out of it. Well, I, that was a, yes, that was a much more adequate introduction to, uh, <laughs> thanks for letting me our, tell a story in there too. To our guest easy. today. Well, no. And I mean, to be honest with you, Rick, like we're going to, we're going to just stretch that out probably for the next, uh, do it, man. minutes or so, unpack, because yep. you know, what, what I, what I'm greeted with today is a very f- polished, finished product, my man. Um, and I'm not saying that to blow smoke. It's clearly something you've worked towards. Um, For sure. And like you said, it's the planets are aligning now. So, you know, it's up to you how far back you want to go. But I, I'm pretty curious about that upbringing and that, you know, yeah, that, that teenage version of you. Because I'm sure you were just some insecure, pimply faced kid like the rest of us. So <laughs> that... What are some of those bumps and what's that transition? Yeah, you say you, you grew up in the Chicago area? 
I did. Yeah. That's okay. an interesting perspective too, man. Cause I mean, I, I was bullied when I was a kid, you know, and it wasn't, it wasn't anything crazy, you know, to where it was, it was just boys being boys. And most of it was in like middle school and junior high, you know, to where I see the bullying there. It's, it's a bunch of testosterone as you know, the boys start becoming men going into sure. the 12 and 13 year old versions of ourselves. And I did I got into a few fights when I was a kid. I never started one, but I got into a few of them. I won every single one. I like saying that. But, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> but, it, but when it comes to it, it's a, an important point because bullies, for the most part, I learned this young, bullies, for the most part, don't expect somebody to stand up to them. You know, they just expect to steamroll over them. And I see that a lot with lawyers today, too. Because, <laughs> I, mean, I, I mean, in cybersecurity, one of the verticals that we focus in is law firms. Right. So these yeah. guys are are professional arguers. You know, they're professional bullies. Yeah. They go into a courtroom and they're just looking to, to roll over whoever is their opponent. And they're not really used to somebody standing up to them that's not one of their peers in their own profession. So especially with the IT guy. Right. And I don't dress like an IT guy. You know, it's not the the khaki pants and the the polo shirt. You know, I, I used yep. to be overweight. I'm not now. You know, I'm pretty buff now. I, I, I've worked <laughs> at that too. Yeah. But when you walk in there and you have that confidence, like that's great. You know, it's but you can tell them there was one meeting I remember, dude. You know, to where it's like you know, existing client. We're gonna see if you're still doing for us what you're going to do, and we're gonna we're gonna go out and look for other people. You know, so when I got in there. It was within the first 90 seconds. I'm like, you guys seem like you made your decision already. So if you'll excuse me, I'm just going to see myself out <laughs> within 90 seconds into the meeting. Like, no, 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 please go ahead and sit back down. Please. No, we, we just want to get a clearer picture of what's going on. You know, it was almost like they're saying all that stuff we just said about finding somebody else. It's not really true. All the mind you know? games. Right? Exactly. Like yeah. So that, bullies, for the most part, they don't expect you to stand back up to them. And that's something I learned really, really young. Uh, and that, right. that's, but still, I mean, it, it puts you in an interesting position whenever you get into those. So that, that pimply phase dude, man, I, I didn't really like dry. I always had a, a different mind to be outside the box. Of course. I mean, that, that's something that I believe I was born with, but who I became was really kind of a product of the conditioning around me and how I chose to deal with the issues that came at me. Like my dad okay. died when I was 16, you know, okay. leukemia. It was, we found out he was sick about a year and a half before he died. And throughout that process, he was doing like injections to keep the thing at bay. And they told him, you know, if you don't have a procedure done, which is a bone marrow transplant, that's the only cure that they had at that time. You're going to die anyways at some point because this thing's going to kick in a high gear and there's not going to be anything we can do. So he had the procedure done. But then the way they do that, what he actually died from was like a staph infection. That's yeah. it. You know, because it, when you kill the immunity. bone marrow in your body, your immune system is done. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you're killing. It's just like a chemo assessment, yeah, exactly. right? Like you're yeah. killing, you're killing everything just shy of you. Um, right on, right on. Uh, and when that happened, man, I, I mean, my brother and sister are five and six years younger than me. You know, okay. my mom was only working like an eight dollar an hour job as like a receptionist or something like that, even though she had gotcha. a college degree. Uh, it's that my dad, he was an insurance salesman. So he actually made sure that he was well covered you know, to cover the house and everything else. But sure. that meant that really we were just trying to live off of an $8 an hour job and the social security because uh, that life insurance policy covered the house and it covered the medical bills, but nothing else beyond that. Yeah. So you had a certain yeah. amount of security based on his preparation. Exactly. Um, yeah. It eliminated the major bills. But day-to-day -day needs was based off my mom with an $8 an hour job. Is That's this I, where, and so with such an illustrious resume like that, or, you know, let me say maybe um, with such cool qualifications that way, yeah. um, it's a little hard to sort like where your like primary skill set was there. Yeah, like I when feel you yeah. think about like where your primary skill set was at that point in time, like did, yeah. did you start to become an entrepreneur or was is cybersecurity, is cybersecurity something you sell or something you design? I it guess both. just just to yeah. kind of help 
Okay. I, I crossed over to the dark side a few years ago. When I say that, I moved out of the engineering side into sales, you know, and just okay. running the yeah. business and building the business. So uh, there's not a lot of software. Yeah. <laughs> you started <laughs> making some real money. Good for you. Exactly. For you. Yeah, right yeah. now. Well, I, I started, <laughs> I transitioned from doing the job into building a business. That's really mm-hmm. the transition that took sure. place. You know, because mm-hmm. most will go out there, you know, the, like me. I mean, I was laid off from a job, you know, and I'm like, okay, I guess I'm going to do this for myself now. You know, it's a, I knew I needed people, you know, to, in order to grow, that was cool. But it was when I made the definitive decision to stop doing the job and to build and grow a business, that's when things really started taking off monetarily. So is that the industry? Cause, and you kind of mentioned like you had some involvement with the ministry, maybe falling out. I don't know if you're still a Christian or not, but like, are you, are you like, so was your skill set built and like your 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 industry experience kind of in that cyber world? Are you guys like building firewalls and stuff? I mean, yeah, um, just was. like foundationally, right? Because we have a pretty yeah. like technical uh, listener group um, that oh, you know, cool. awesome. certainly Let's interested in like. Dude, yeah, I the built way my you, first you computer when I was ten years old. <laughs> yeah, my, a, a Tandy computer. Yes, okay. when I when I was ten. Yeah, so if you, that's that's good to know about the audience, man. Technically, yes, absolutely. It's, so. During that transition, but I've been playing instruments since I was five. My dad had a music degree. So there's the okay. tie into the music side. And he was also on the board at the church, you know. So I started the same year I started building computers is the same year I started playing drums in the church band. You know, so okay. it, was, it was simultaneous with that. And then when I was 16, that's when I got into, I wanted to do law enforcement, you know, for a protective thing. So I became a police cadet. But then okay. I, going through the tech stuff through those years was just more of a hobby. And then I mm-hmm. really, really got involved when I said, screw the law enforcement stuff because the Marines didn't want me. Just medical history of asthma, that kind of thing. And I started working for Merrill Lynch, but in the warehouse. And people saw that I had an aptitude and they pulled me out of there and trained me on the job. And I ended up deploying in the enterprise space after I learned, you know, if you want to get technical, DHCP, DNS, you know, mm-hmm. firewalls, routing, IP, everything. During that time period, within six months, it was like a freaking crash course, like a boot okay. camp. I deployed okay. 15,000 servers and 120,000 workstations across all of the branch offices of Merrill Lynch <laughs> across the U.S. And so this is like early on. This like, so 18, the, 18, the, 18 years old. The years. Not, not to date you too much, but it's like early, early years on. ago. Yep. Yeah, okay, I cool. was going to okay. say, like, no, that makes good sense mid to sure. late 90s is where my head was. Yeah, you got like it. Pre, <laughs> pre-managed service providers, like pre, this isn't even an it. idea. Data centers are like, that's like Pentagon shit at that point right in time. On. Yep. You're like really protecting the actual endpoint units. Um, right on. Okay. Exactly. Hey, it's Ryan. Mike and I need your help. We, uh are getting to the end of our Rolodexes of interesting people to bring to you. Sure, we're fortunate enough to have folks reach out now from outside of the podcast land to record with us, but we'd like you as our listener to suggest somebody that you might know that has an interesting story. We'd love to talk to them. How do you do it? You could get at us on Instagram, Facebook, or send us an email at conventionnot at sunorstorm.com. And if I can maybe less technically, uh, or sorry, I, I can't help like, myself. No, with no, the technical no. Questions. I love, you know. I love you guys sharing this banter. I'll be honest. It's not really my world, but <laughs> I'm thinking about you being an 18 year old with what's your college education at that? Like, are you like a self-taught kind of like not hacker? I don't mean to like put a label on it, but like, are you kind of one of those guys? You've just taught yourself everything. That's exactly it. Yeah. Two and weeks. Literally oh, Merrill God. Lynch is like, there's a dude in the mail room that knows more <laughs> than like the receptionist. We might that ask. Exactly we, it. I mean, like that's some that's shit, cool. dude. Like, cause yeah. sorry, but that's what gets me excited. You're an 18 yeah. year old and you're like, man, they just gave me the keys to the, like, yeah. and for you, you were probably like, Oh my God, this is so fun. Like you had exactly. access to all yeah. that, all that equipment. Yep. Right and, on. Oh, wow. Like I'm going to figure this out, you know, and we did. Cause I knew a lot going into it already just from mm-hmm. what I, what I had done in the past. Dude, I was, when I was 15, I was, uh, I was a sophomore in high school and I was taking, you know, Pascal. I don't, Ryan, I don't know if you know sure. this, but that was a programming language, right? Yeah. I, yeah, I remember that one. Like post cobalt. Yeah, pre, exactly. Pre <laughs> Python. <laughs> yep. <laughs> 
pre-C++ or whatever. Yeah, yeah right. Just yeah. pre-C++. Yeah. Plus, Very right, right. pre-C++. You're really getting into the nerd stuff now. But sure. Yeah. <laughs> I do. Oh, my gosh. You're bringing up memories. I remember when I was in uh, sixth grade, and I, I was programming in BASIC at the time. Mm-hmm. You know, and it, there was a science fair, right? And everyone's, you know, like doing experiments on, you know, w- you know, milk, right? I remember one on how fast milk spoils, you know, if it's 2% milk or skim milk, you know, if it's still really milk when it's skim milk, that kind of stuff. And yeah. here's me like, I need to borrow three computers from the computer lab, please. You know, and they were like Apple two E's because I'm going to yeah, write yeah. this thing. And I want to show you the differences between DOS basic and Apple two E basic on the color variance between the two and see which ones match up and which ones don't. And your teachers are like, hold up. That's exactly. not even science. We don't even <laughs> yeah. know what you're talking about. Yeah. I know. Because I was doing it at home. At home, I had a PC. I had the Tandy. But then at school, mm-hmm. it was all apples. And I'm starting to do stuff I'm like, what? These colors aren't matching up. You know, I'm trying to do stuff at home. And that was the thing. I'm like, I wonder. I'm like, this is my project. It's I'm going to see language. across. Exactly. I'm going to see across 256 colors to see which ones match up between DOS on a PC and an Apple IIe in the native language yeah. that they had in base. Yeah, I remember that. Sure. Yeah, so I just it. programmed something stupid, right? Like a like a knife going across the screen into a board or something like that. It was just mm-hmm. a visual. So I was even doing marketing at that point, right? Because I'm the only kid at the science fair in sixth grade that has three computers set up. Everyone else is doing stupid yeah. crap with milk and everything else, you know? So they come over and I'm trying to explain this stuff to them. And they're just like, oh, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I could see that they were lost. Yeah. Right? They're like, yeah, you get a first. You know, and there was no <laughs> winner. But they just like, yeah, you get the top marks because we have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah. that was a psychology thing, too, for me. And I started thinking, like, if you can just sound smart. I could have just made a bunch of crap up. But if I would have just sounded smart that they didn't know about these people that were 40 years older than me, I still would have gotten the best grade. (laughs) Yeah. Well, it's like a strange validation, right? Like, you know, we're all in a similar demographic, I'm sure. And so we very much so were born and kind of raised in a, in an analog world. And then there was this situation and like, I'm going to be honest with you, probably the first few years of my actual professional career, I was just good at Googling stuff. Right. And you know, I'm a creative thinker too, but ultimately that, helped us like if if you could translate between those two worlds right like it's more than just confusing your teachers at age you know age 10 or 12 of course. Or, you know whatever yep. you are it becomes and it starts to compound into understanding that like as long as you can live above like deliverables but below actions like you're in a good spot um, <laughs> if, if you want to sell your own services right yeah, i mean sure. um, yeah. right you know, this is not a show about my philosophy on consulting but like you know often we we, we end up having a lot of folks like you who hustled their way through right whatever their yeah. educational background was they started a little company they sold a company so on and so forth and so I get, I, you know, I'm fortunate enough to have read a little bit of your bio and, and I understand that's kind of where, where, where we took it. So I don't want to dissuade away from motivation. Um, but I think no, that the okay. way that you get you start to, to understand psychology and motivation taps into that too. Yes. You know, well, at a very absolutely. young age at sixth grade, I learned what marketing was because I learned just to put on a good show period, mm-hmm. you know, because mm-hmm. mine looked different than everybody else and more high tech and more visually appearing. That's why I had six teachers around me rather than the two that normally go to, you know, from student to student, right. everybody huddled around me just because like, what's this kid doing? Yeah, well, you influence that, people based on validation too, right? Yeah. And so regardless of age, and if you're lucky enough, I think to learn as a kid that you can be validated by adults based on your intelligence, not just based on like your cuteness, which is something I think it happens to a lot of kids, right? Oh, yeah. Like they yeah, just yeah. get validated because they're cute. And so you know, when you really start to separate, you know, adolescence, forgive me, I probably don't know about as much about psychology as you might, but like in that time in between like, you know, childhood and adolescence, when you start to become validated by adults because of your skill set, I think it's like a, a thousand percent, 750 percent batting average to put it into sports terms where like you end up becoming successful because it doesn't just have to be, I mean, you're, you're, clearly like a prime example of that success. But like, there's a lot of spots in between where if you were fortunate enough to be validated and understand that like your efforts of linking computers together, whatever your medium might be, represent a value to somebody else. Like money doesn't just, money becomes a bit of the scoreboard component instead of it just being like, I need to get paid to survive. 
Oh man, I, uh, money's never been a driver, and that's probably because I I don't know. Some people grow up poor, and then they uh, I'm just going to chase money, right? But I'm just looking at you know I just want to do stuff that has value for people, you know. Mm-hmm. And maybe that's the the Christian side of things too, you know, because I I still 100 percent believe, man. I have I think I model the beliefs more so than what most do that are in leadership in of some churches, which is sure. ironic. You know, because they're, they're in the positions, you know, it's, uh, but yet, uh, you know, I, I did, uh, I don't know I, if this is an explicit show or not, but it was funny because I did stand up on, on Broadway, uh, you know, I've, I've done a lot of stuff, right? I did stand up on Broadway <laughs> before it shut down just in January this year. And mm-hmm. there were two pastors, right? Because I'm ordained, right? There, there were, there's two pastors that were in the show and he's going to be a Christian comedian. He's now a really good friend of mine, you know, okay. trying to bring like a true comedy to the Christian realm rather than like the stupid Christian comedy, right? <laughs> the stuff that's actually funny, you know, not the inside church yeah, jokes. Yeah. You know? <laughs> like the super G rated stuff, yeah. right? Let's, let's step it up yeah. from that just exactly. a little bit. Right, like the right. real. So, I mean, he's up there talking about masturbation, which is freaking hilarious. You know, everything <laughs> that he's coming from the pastor, but I start out myself like, yeah, you know, there's two pastors in the show and you know, you can bleep this up, but, and I'm the one who says fuck, you know? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I love he, it. I, he won't, but it's funny because his thing to maintain his image because I'm not in the church now, right? But it, but he'll quote me saying that as long as he's quoting oh, really? me, it's okay oh, for his so audience. Yeah, that's, like Rick, if I'm quoting somebody else, it's cool. <laughs> you know? But I just can't say it myself. <laughs> are you are you familiar with the with the TV show Crashing? No, it's I've a, never seen right, it. Like Rick, you got to oh, look man. into Crashing because it's it, the I I'm. Um, I'm forgetting the Showtime. comedian's name. Yeah. It's either Showtime or HBO, but it's basically it's a stand up yeah. comedian. He's probably in his like early 30s, but he grew up extremely, extremely Christian. Um, and he's he's still within the church, but he's constantly going through this like turmoil of yeah, yeah. Can I be both? Can I can I be a successful touring comedian? Um, and it's have really my, but good. you know, yeah, it's it's a really good show, to, yeah, and I any, think yeah. you'll love it. You'll love yeah, it. It's the called answer crashing. Is yes. I um. I, I, I want to, I want to make the state. I do 100% believe in the church, you know, and I 100% believe in God. Jesus is my savior. You know, it's just churches. There's, there's more politics in the church that I feel that there, than there is in the freaking white house. You know, sure. that's one of the things that kind of dissuaded me from continuing in that role. There, I was always the number two. I helped launch three churches, and I was always the music guy and the business guy because I mean that's just what I do, right? Mm-hmm. I, ne- I offered six figure salaries as these things are growing, and I never wanted that because it was never even about the money. You know, and I always I didn't want the job. I didn't want the top dude job yeah. in, in the church either because I wanted to be more of a maverick, more of a rogue. Well, and you wanted to be able <laughs> really? to get out, right? Like, <laughs> exactly. I mean, yep. I, exactly. I wanted to be a dude that could just do what he wants, almost kind of like gangster style, you know, because it's like nobody's got a control on me, but yet I'm bringing value and you can't live without me in the moment. So I'm going to do the real deal for everybody that's walking in the door because I'm not going to filter things and I'm going to give them the straight truth because I'm not worried about how much they're giving or whatever yeah, else. Exactly. If my paycheck's going to go down, you know, I, I just want to provide really what everybody comes here for not this, this facade of what it's supposed to be. Mm-hmm. Well, you're, you, you require absolute independence, right? Yeah. And I mean, I think yeah. that's a that's not unique to the church or any. I think there's something inherent in in guys like us, whether it's Mavericks or this or that. Like I, I love that that term, but I never call myself it. That we're just really reluctant to be. And you know, this is going to be thrown in a bunch of directions. But like, don't don't tie me down. Don't label me. Yeah. Don't like. Yeah. Don't tell me what people who do what I do. Don't tell me how to do it. Like I, yeah, and uh, you, you affiliate yourself with an organization. Well, suddenly that becomes like all these trappings, you know, yeah, and you know, yeah. we all start to look the same and I don't know. I feel like that's a natural thing. in a lot of us that it's, you get to the point where you're like, you know what? No one's hiring me. I'm going to start my own business that sticks with you. You know, like oh, the yeah, next time yeah. you walk in and someone's like, you want to be a part of our organization? You're like, ah, I got nothing against. It's not the organization. It's me. It's not you. Yeah. It's me. It's not you. It's me. I swear. I'm the round peg. I don't fit. Okay. Exactly. That's it. Right. Yeah. I want to show up. I'll contribute 
but I don't yeah. want to be held down to this. Yeah. Like I see your manual and you know, all these things I have to stipulate yeah. and abide by. Yeah. How about I do like 99% of that? But right I can't, like, I can't I got my lane over well. here and I know I'm accomplishing a lot in my lane. So I'm just going to stay over here and still support you. If we can come back to the money thing real quick, you know, cause it, a lot of people will pursue money. Yeah, and it just as the be all and end all because sure. that, that's like the envisioning of whatever. And dude, I got nice stuff. I mean, I'm wearing a twenty thousand dollar watch right now. I drive yeah, an yeah. Aston Martin. <laughs> you know, I, this isn't even my most expensive watch either. You know, I've got one that has black diamonds on it. You know, so you're definitely but, gonna get excluded from the chair at some exactly, point. Exactly, right? I know. But dude, however much <laughs> I've spent on my junk, I've spent ten times that. I've given ten times that. To, to people, to organizations, to everything else. And I know that's why I have this stuff because now I can play at a higher level. I can mm-hmm. be accepted into groups to do bigger business deals. Money is nothing but a tool. All this stuff, yeah, I like it. It blows off steam. Who doesn't want to wear a $20,000 watch? You know, and I never thought I wanted to wear it until I bought it and put it on my wrist. You know, just growing up poor, it was always, uh, I don't want that stuff. I don't need that stuff. I don't need a big house. You know, I don't want, until you have it, and you're like, yeah. wow. And then people look at you different. But then when people look at you different, you have a choice when you make all that money. You have a choice to say, you know what? That's cool. I'm just going to have the stupid parties and I'm going to go into, into this playing life mode. Or I can use this to get to another another level because the higher the levels I go in business and in life, that's the more that's just more people I can help. The more money I have means the more I can give away. And I've always seen that. And in the church environment, when I couldn't pay my mortgage, dude, launching this church, it was like an amplifier went out. You're we having troubles with the mic as we were going in, right? It was reminding me of this stuff. <laughs> uh, when an amplifier went out at a brand new baby church, you know, that has like 15 people, the new amplifier costs 500 bucks, right? It's like, I got that in my pocket right now. Okay. Yeah. More than that. But at that point in time, it's like, man, I don't even have my checking account balance is negative. Right. And I'm just going to write the check because I feel God told me to do this. And this is something that I need to do just for a hundred bucks. Cause he's like, if five people give a hundred dollars, that'll make it. That's 500 bucks. Like, I really feel that we need to do this. Got two newborn twins, whatever we need to do this. The very next day, this is when I was working for geek squad, right? When I accepted the geek squad role, the first one in Chicago, the very next day, dude, I had a 10, I didn't even know this was coming. My paycheck, my pay stub had a $10,000 annual increase on it. This was a Sunday when I gave that hundred bucks and the very next day was a $10,000 annual increase. <laughs> uh, how do you deny this stuff? Right. Yeah. And uh, from that moment on, I was, you know, I was, this was 12 years ago. I'm like, well, shoot, you know, money is a tool. It's nothing more because now I have more, which means that I can go do more for others. And that's always been the case. You know, so when it comes to tithing, you know, and we can get into the spiritual stuff, it's like the churches say 10%, 10%, whatever it is, you know, uh, mine's probably more like 25% is what I give I guess out. I didn't know that churches paper. specify. Yeah. This is like just, a whole new thing. I don't even know that term you just Wait, said. There's like Sorry. a deal, tithing? Like tithing. Tithing. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Your tithe is your your obligation to God, right? And and it's like taxes for God. Exactly. (laughs) Yes. That's the way it's presented (laughs) for the most part. Well, because like there's an institution you have to build, right? I mean, like there is, it takes money. You have to have electricity in in the worship facility, right? No doubt about it. You're right. And I would run the business side and even put together budgets. Churches need freaking money to power the lights, to to do the things, you know, all Mm -hmm. of it. And this tithing scenario comes from Abraham in the Bible to where he says, God, anything you give to me, I will give back to you 10%. Right. Oh, this, that's where okay, the number so that's where the number from. Is little, little, is from. Okay. okay. Exactly. It's an old Testament thing, but it mm-hmm. wasn't an obligation. He didn't say, God, you told me to do this. So I'm going to give you back 10%. No, it was, I'm grateful for what you've done for me. And because of that, I will always give you back 10%. It was a commitment that he gave. Right. So that there's this concept, not a specific number, but a concept gotcha. that really is what tithing is. So when mm-hmm. anything comes across my plate, man, this is something that I know how I'm used. If something comes across my plate, of course, I'm not going to be stupid about it. But almost anything that I hear about, you know, even if it's just money on the street, 
from a homeless dude or something like that. I'll question his ass. Believe me, it'll be like, you know, if, if it's some dude that was in the military or whatever it is, you know, this is the CIA training I have too, which we can dive into that sometime. But it's, I started asking, it's like, you know, I was with the 19th, you know, battalion or what I don't even, I'm not even saying the right words, but I'm like, oh, cool, man. Where were you stationed? I'll start asking questions. Yeah. You know, yeah. and mm-hmm. the ones that have like spot on answers immediately, they're sure. telling the truth. And yep. it's like, well, cool. and if they're asking for 20 bucks, I'll give them a hundred. Like, dude, go feed your family, right? Because 20 it. bucks ain't going to feed your family or go buy some new clothes so you can go get a job tomorrow. Here's mm-hmm. $100 to get you started because you're being honest with me. You're truthful. You know, anytime anything, I mean, even up to an amount of $10,000, right? A, a church of all places, you know, do it, do it. C- doing a new renovation and COVID was hitting them hard, called me up and he's like, you've helped us in the past. He's like, this is our need right now. I'm like, cool. How much do you need? It's like, well, really we need $10,000. Like, awesome. It'll be there tomorrow. Yeah. And that he wasn't even expecting the whole thing. Yeah. He was just, the whole phrase was like, can you help us out a little bit? You know, what, what can you send us? I'm like, you got the whole thing, man, because it, you're asking. And I know that when something comes across my plate, I have to do it. And now I know because I'm doing that, I'm going to get more. And Something because I else. get more, yep. means I can help again in an even greater amount. That's mm-hmm. the reciprocating. Some people call it karma. You know, my spiritual foundation tells me this is just the way that God works. It's as simple as that. No, it's I like so faith, that. right? I mean, because exactly. even karma is faith. I mean, you know, I don't want to split everybody's individual definitions about such a personal subject, but right, like that is faith. Yeah. I mean, that it will come back to you, right? Always, always, 100%. It's, I even think it's just a natural law. Maybe it's, if you don't believe in God and you're listening, fine. Just accept it as a natural law. It's just good to do good things for other people. End of story. Hey, for right. No, and yeah. that's, I, anybody wants to debate that, it's not going to have a long conversation with me. Right on. Not on this show. No, I mean, it's a big part of what we talk about. Well, because we're, we're blessed to have, and Mike, I'm so sorry. I know you're, you're, you no, you no, got no. something there, but we're blessed to have, um, or we're fortunate to have, and I think it's part of our skill to have these like different guests who they may not be religious or they may not be um, faithful, but they're all spiritual yeah. Um, yeah. in different ways, which uh, we see and hear about. Sometimes it's about religion. Sometimes it's about community. Sometimes it's about yeah. education. Yeah. Um, you know, there's so many different things that fuel people's faith. Right. Um, but it's almost like, when I look up about the negative things that are out there, it's a lack of faith that like contributes to the law- lawlessness that, yeah. that like frustrates everybody. Oh, yeah. Right. Like, you know, I think um, people right now are super frustrated because it's things are they're going on that are lawless, right? No matter which side of the law you feel like you're on completely different story. Oh, I would rather talk about positive all, vibes. All vibes. Board, yeah. Right. Yeah. But it's, but it's lawlessness. And like in order to have laws, you have to have a certain amount of faith. Right. And so there's so many people who are misrepresented. I agree with that um, wholeheartedly in, in America. And there's so many people who are asked to tolerate lawlessness from the, another party that they don't understand that or have yeah. faith. In, yeah. Right. Um, and, and it's so easy to see where a lot of that stuff starts to break down. Or, you know, I think sometimes we have actors that um, that help it to break down or are invested in, in yeah. breaking us down. Um, Dude, do you get to see any of that? Sure. Yeah, I, I do see a lot of that. And it's interesting that you're relating that to faith because, I mean, if you want to get specific, the whole defund the police movement, there's zero faith in that crowd for the most part anyway. Some are just along for the ride, which is another thing, right? But the defund the police movement is lack of faith in the system itself, in, yeah. in the police. Yeah. It's all mm-hmm. that it is. You know, and if you follow that trail, you know, almost nobody really, really wants to defund the police. People just want a better system. They want, they want right. fairness across the board, but it's then protest it's protest language, that, right? The word yeah. defend, defund is protest exactly. Language. It's yeah. They're power words, right? So they're using <laughs> these power words of defund the police and it comes across that way. But then there's some people that take it to the extreme to where they're really saying, Hey, let's do this. But it's, <laughs> it's a lack of faith it, for what you're saying. It's a lack of faith in the system itself. Mm-hmm. And that's really what needs to be addressed. So how do you restore that faith? There's probably several different things that have to happen. I don't know what they would be to make the perfect scenario, you know, but let's, let's look at, I don't know, you know, I know in Illinois, you know, even though uh, I don't know which side of the spectrum or the aisle that I fall on, you know, but there was an idea floated in Illinois to where it's, Hey, let's make cops 
license themselves with the Department of Professional Regulation. Now, I have had a physical protection agency. I'm talking like guns and guards. You know, I've even been on people like uh, Rahm Emanuel, you know, f- former press secretary or media, whatever sure. it is for Obama and mayor of Chicago. Mm-hmm. I've protected Caitlyn Jenner. You know, so it's a, a legit business that I've had where we've had to register with the state. And it's yeah. odd to me that a police officer would not have to register with the freaking state, you know, or be part, part of that system to where yeah, like this is a novel idea. Wait yeah. a minute. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> it, exactly. You know, or be licensed, you know, and then go through like a psychological evaluation or show that they have, you know, certain amounts of training or experience, just like a freaking security guard would have to, a cop doesn't have to go through that legislative, that, or that logistical process. Mm -hmm. Is it a hurdle? I don't know if it's the right answer, but it's some kind of answer. It's like, it just makes you think it's like, why hasn't this been happening the whole time? Well, it would increase faith, right? Like I think that when we listen to those groups, those opposing groups, and I really appreciate the way you approach this question, right? Because like sometimes when we start to talk about defund the police, like both of us are like not our kind of show, but this is a, this is like a deep fucking subject, man. Pardon French, but like, (laughs) If you don't increase the faith, if you don't increase your own faith somehow in a group that you don't understand, yeah, then you need to go like not you need to. The result is typically conflict, right? Yeah. And so like conflicts may be war, conflicts may be verbal, conflicts may be violent. But like ultimately, like if you if you're not able to extend just that minimal amount of faith for sure to yourself it starts with yourself, right? But then it also, you know, it really starts to go into those other other people, right? You yeah. know, faith that that protest isn't going to burn down a small business if you want like the anecdotal anecdotal reciprocal right now. Yeah. Right? Oh um, man, that's the stupidest um, thing. You know, and if there's anyone listening, you know, if you've gone to a protest, that's cool. You know, I'm, I'm all for that. I've been, not this time around, but I've gone to some in the past too. You know, and when it's a peaceful scenario, I mean, that's a, I'm big into our constitution guys, you know, right to assemble, right. And right to petition. That's what mm-hmm. a protest is. Those two sure. <laughs> combined is the right to petition and the, 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 the right to, to assemble or to gather. And it speaks when, out against lawlessness. Yeah, that, exactly. You know, it's exactly. One step from violence, right? Yep, Protest is one sure. step from violence. And if it's done the way it's supposed to, then it's effective. Right on the, the violence, just you're hurting your own people when you do that. Yeah. You know, because uh, most of the most of the protests are happening. And it's not like St. Louis, right, to where it was the white couple that came mm-hmm. out with the guns, right? Most of them are not that. Most of them have been in inner city where they're low income neighborhoods to begin with, and they're breaking down the boards and everything and, and looting. It's a, you're hurting your own demographic that way. Sure. You know, and that's the part that doesn't make sense to me because if we're trying to stand up for everybody, I mean, that, that literally means everybody, you know, and th- there's a phrase that I saw, it's not mine, but there's a phrase that I saw that, it, you know, it, before all lives can matter, black lives have to matter, you know, and I'm in on that too, because that makes perfect sense because it's an oppressed people, right? And you can't even say that all lives matter until you truly believe that black lives matter. You know, it's, it's like a, yeah. a subgroup. So it, it has to, they have to happen concurrently. Mm-hmm. It has to be both all lives matter and black lives matter. You can't have one without the other. It makes mm-hmm. no sense. So, While well, we're linking together things that we've heard elsewhere, there was a statement like that, that I thought that was really good is that like there's equality and then there's equity, right? Yeah. And equity means that you have stake in something. Yeah. Equality means like, Quality should kind of be assumed. Like I would think, if you polled most people in any you know moderate environment, especially ours yeah. in the United States, people believe in equality. But I think it's pretty easy to grasp that when something isn't yours, the desire to destroy it, it it's uh, it's it's easier for that to reign a supreme. Okay, yep. that yep. is the reality of the situation, and I think that in a lot of the communities with which we reference, right, um, we should have Chris, another one of our co-hosts here, who 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 doesn't come on every single time like Mike and I, but he's on, and he you know is able to 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 really kind of you know infer this in a little bit different way. But the reality is, is that like if you don't have equity in a community, then like what are what value would you be expected to have? Yeah, yeah. right. Like like if I don't own something. This isn't about owning your home or living in an apartment or all of those maybe cliches or unfortunate anecdotes we've yep. been typecast people with. But like, if I don't have equity in my community, then like, what is the value that I should hold for that community? Because yeah. that community, assumptively, I don't have faith that that community holds that value for me. 
Right on, my man. And it, it, I feel like it, I'm stealing your interview, dude. I'm sorry, no, but this is like it. this is deep this shit. This is what man. I love. I love the content. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'll talk about myself all day long, but I like talking about just things too. You know, and this is stuff that really matters. You know, I think. I, I mean, if you're able to push this, I, again, I'm going to stop cutting. This is something I try to do, but I think that like when I read your media and I've seen a decent amount of your media, your media yeah. is fortunate enough because your st- your story is so compelling. Yeah. But I'm not sure that like there's a bunch of media like this that really like really helps display your sensibility in the way that you are able to like amplify that out to the people that you inspire. Oh, dude, so, there's not. No, I've got good, I've got a good branding team, which is fantastic. But if you're talking general mass media, you know, yeah. anything that we've even said today, I mean, first we're three white dudes, you know, that are talking about this stuff, you know, <laughs> so you Min- hopefully up. minimizes the impact. Hopefully minimizes yeah. it. Yeah. Right, right on. Yeah. Right. But I was on a show for July 4th. That was myself an awesome black dude and an awesome Hispanic dude, and we were just really talking about issues. That's it. And it was yeah. an amazing, amazing conversation, you know, because I gained insight from them because there's no possible way as a white dude with blue eyes that I could possibly be in the shoes of a nope. black guy it's a powerful and understand statement. everything they've gone through. There's no way that, I, that could ever right. happen. Right. And I, right. With and that's that, okay. I, it, it is okay. What's up, Convention Net listener? Thanks for spending the time with Mike and I today. What we're really looking to do is to grow our listener base time and time again. We've been doing the show for quite some time now. And one of the things we've learned is that the people who listen to us are our best assets. They give us a good idea about what to talk about, who we might want to interview, and they tell others about the show. So if you dig it, don't keep it a secret. Get out on your review channel, tell a friend, or drop us an email and give us a suggestion about something you might like to hear about. You know, you don't have to understand to care. Yeah, so exactly. just having that conversation is me caring and saying, awesome, well, let's come to a solution on this, you know, and it, all of them agreed, all of them that I was other like the riots don't make any sense. Because if we go back to that, you know, before all lives can matter, black lives have to matter. But if you're if you're just only black lives matter and not all lives matter, that then you're the rioters. Because now you yeah. almost don't even care about your own demographic, your own people yeah. or anybody else. I think when we look back upon it, we're going to see that the rioting component, it's almost like the same way we treat mental health in America. We're going to see that there were some thumbs. I don't know where the thumbs are. Please don't crucify me for this. I think the (laughs) thumbs are probably on different sides of the scale. Dude, that's always the way it is. Yeah. This this isn't like the Revolutionary War or the March of Dr. Martin Luther King. You know, this is different. You know, it's just in Chicago. I mean, you know, we've got federal troops coming in now. And the reason being is because some stupid idiots are starting to chuck frozen water bottles at the cops. Yeah, man. You know, that's great. Go take out your aggression on a freaking, you know, boxing bag or something like that. Yeah. You know, because that's not going to solve anything. It's Mm -hmm. never going to. I get that you're pissed. Cool. Let's start a dialogue. You know, I get that sometimes you need to get together as a group because people need to see masses in unison in order to spark revolution and change. That has to happen. That's why we can protest. That's why it's a legal right to be able to do that is you have to see yeah. that there's a massive amount of people that think people. the same way. Yeah, sure. Exactly. But then it's always a small little group that, that's just the violent ones that are just the stupid assholes. You know, and that, that's that that's always who it is, you know, and it doesn't have to be. I mean, think about when this country was founded, too. Right. You know, there was some violence that existed, but it was not organized war. There was even like rules of engagement, you know, and, and rules of quarter to where you didn't harm the people after you captured them. You know, mm-hmm. it was it was like the most civility that you could ever see in a war was the American Revolutionary War because mm-hmm. of how they treated each other. You know, now there were ways that we broke that just because we were so passionate about being free. And were we an oppressed people? I don't know, because if we went to England, everybody was like that. And it was all white people in England. You know, (laughs) it wasn't like it was a minority thing. You know, to be fair, that was before 
what we're talking about the American impression though. Right. Like, it like is. all that's kind of mixed into the same like time. That's good. No, I don't want to interject your, your no, I, I do. I understand like, what you're you know. saying. All I'm saying, you know, even if it was multiple ethnicities back at that time, mm-hmm. regardless right now, I see an American as an American as an American. Uh, and it, that's the way that it absolutely should be. I was even going through voting rights with someone the other day and, it, you know, cause it, someone who wants to become a U.S. citizen, they have to study up on all the civics and yeah. going through all of this information. It's like, wow, you know, because there was women's suffrage, you know, and there's, there's like four amendments that address voting rights, you know? And the question was, well, why does this one say that an African American man can vote when this one says that a man can vote? Like it's the order. Of the amendments. Yeah. One was yeah. before the other. Because he, even though men could vote, that still excluded black men. And right. even at that point, women couldn't even vote. Whether you were white or not, women couldn't vote at that point in time. It was a reserved right for men, which was also stupid. You know, and you go back to the to the Constitution Declaration of Independence, you know, that we believe that all men are created equal. That men phrase might have literally meant just dudes with penises that are white. Right (laughs) back at that point. But today, that's not what it means because we have a more expanded view. And in order for all lives to matter, black lives have to matter. But the reverse is true, too. You know, let's let's accelerate equality. But that's what we have to accelerate, not rising above anything else or doing damage to our own people for the sake of just getting a, a phrase or a statement out or just for the hell of it. I'm uh, Sorry, I've, I've, no, no, I, I, I gotta be honest. It's, um, it's not the heaviness of the topic. I've just been really, yeah. uh, entertained by listening to the two of you, um, <laughs> kind of chat about it. No, I'm, I'm not being a smart ass. Sincerely. I haven't no, had no. anything to add. Talk about a little more. <laughs> no, you know what, man, like what I want to talk about. And I apologize if this is like not ideal for you, but like, I'm imagining the sixth grader that wins a science fair. Yeah. And now I've got, you know, Rick in his suit and his nice head of hair. And, you know, you've clearly have been a passionate person your whole life. Can you share with me a little bit about like, why was, why couldn't the 20 year old pay his, his rent? Like, did, what happened there? Did you yeah. fall off for a little bit? Like you, some dark times? Like, I, I had, I, it's a great question, man. That's a really sorry, cool question. I loved, I love wondering oh. like, what's the part of your resume that I, I can't read that. Yeah. The print is yeah. a little too fine. Engineer at heart. A fantastic <laughs> question. Yeah. I, uh, no, I love that. Cause I, I was, uh, I was the first geek squad agent that existed in Chicago and that was right. part of seven across the nation for like this controls right when Best Buy acquired geek squad. And from yeah. there, you know, cause I can put two words together and they were asking me, you know, how come your per ticket price is three times higher than the other seven test stores, the other six test stores? Like, cause I just go in there and see other things that need to be done and ask them if I want to do it or if they want me to okay. do it. Uh, so it's, I mean, it's sales in its most basic form, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and coming from an enterprise level cybersecurity background, I knew things on a scale basis to, to scale these up. So I wrote the sales playbook for Best Buy, for Best Buy for Business. I, I left Geek Squad in that division. They wanted me to go to Minneapolis and be the number two, have me take control of like a third of the US for Geek Squad. I just didn't want to live in Minnesota. That's just a, a, nothing against Minnesotans, but dude, it's even colder than Chicago up there. Not yeah, my, no, not my game. Is. Yeah, mm. <laughs> not my game. Uh, it's uh, plus there's nothing there. But uh, <laughs> it just is what it is. You know, the, hey, there's people that love it, and that's cool, right? There's people that love North Dakota too. You know, beautiful. Yeah, you country. can ice fish a lot. There's a lot of exactly. ice fishing. Yeah. I know. I mean, right on, or Idaho. Cool, go for it. That's not my place. That's all good. I'm more of a city dude, right? <laughs> Big city dude. No, I, I said no to that. I'm like, can I do it from Chicago? Like, no, you can't. I'm like, well, you know, we got this like whole technology thing. Can't I like remote work? You know, this was 2004, 2005. So they said no. I'm like, that's fine. So I, I shifted over to their new B2B division at Best Buy. Uh, mm-hmm. j- just business to business sales, high end technology solutions. They were a VAR for those who are listening, a value added reseller. That's what mm-hmm. Best Buy was springing up. And it was just selling servers with services, you know, so uh, hardware with I services forgot about attached that. to it. Yeah. yeah, it was a business model. Like back three or four back. years that was around. Exactly. Right? Yeah, so yeah. I, I wrote the playbook on how to sell that crap. 
for Best okay. Buy, trained all of their business consultants and everything. And then after the whole thing was run into the ground by some VP that they hired, uh, that's when I was laid off. You know, so okay. in that moment, so you're talking the guy who couldn't pay his bills. That was me because it was 700 people across the U.S. that were shrunken down to 50. And it, there was no matter. I was with the company for seven years, Best Buy. I was working there part time even before Geek Squad just for the discount because it was amazing. Gotcha. Yeah. Economy's so, free falling now. E-commerce is blowing up, right? Exactly. Like, yeah, yeah. This was 2007 when I was laid off. Right okay. in the crash. So pre-economy. Right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Like, right on. Here, yeah. Yeah, for sure. Exactly. So that was the scenario. And when this all came to be, it was two weeks before my twins were born. So it was right in that time too. Well, because you were like, cruising, right? Like you had life kind of yeah, figured man. out. You're probably yeah. in your like mid to late twenties. You got this yep. pretty high up Young, job at Best you Buy. You're getting steady checks. Like, six yeah. figures. Exactly. Yeah, right on. Okay. It, yeah, life is happened, figured out. <laughs> that's what I thought when, you know, it was just climbing the corporate ladder. That, that's yep. all that it was. You know, I always had this inkling of doing things on my own, you know, cause even when I was 20 and 21, I was trying to do like a side web hosting business, right? That was sure. my side hustle. And then I started to realize, cause that was like 2001. It was like, well, the market's saturated for that. That ladder was cushy though, yeah. man. Yeah. yeah that ladder was. is pretty comfortable. It was. That's the problem too, dude. And th that was a hard lesson that I learned there is when you're comfortable, you're never going to grow. You have to make yourself uncomfortable in order to continue going to higher heights. I could have continued to rise up, you know, and do whatever. I already had my, my golden opportunity to go run Geek Squad. You know, one of the dudes that took a third of the country ended up running the whole thing for the nation, who's still a friend of mine. You know, but he okay. finally just figured out the same thing just like three months ago. He was there 10 years after I was there and yeah. texted me. and was like, <laughs> dude, I quit today. And I was like, thank it's God. COVID-19 to help him yeah. out. Yeah. 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 I hate to say it, but he probably hadn't spent the last 10 years improving himself, you know, like you have, right? Like, cause not, it's all probably not. It's, yeah. It was just the, the grind. Right. And that's fine. I mean, it was a passion of his and you know, dude, there's nothing wrong with that. There really isn't, you know, it just depends on what you want in life. You know, and I, I never settle and I can, I mean, it's somewhat of even a disease and a fault of mine too, that I'm learning to adjust because even, you know, people say don't dwell on the losses, right? Well, I don't even dwell on the freaking wins. You know, and I think that needs to hold true for a time period, but that's caused me, especially with people around you, with a team, you have to pause in the moment when you have this huge yeah. win and mm -hmm. celebrate it with everybody, even if it's just Pants for a night. on the back. And, exactly. Yeah. Because everyone around you, dude, they're riding your vision. You know, and th that's what I, I mean. People around, I've hired, I've had bad hires before, but my team that's in place right now loves doing what we're doing. And they love seeing the successes. I mean, I'm the one who went to the White House yesterday, but everyone around me was excited for it. Sure. You know, and that's the thing. It's like we got to take a moment and just stop and be like, we all crushed it. Because I couldn't have gone there if this stuff right here, if it, you know, I wasn't doing these kinds of shows, if I wasn't trying to help other people. And they're keeping everything else flowing so that nothing else misses a beat. You know, because now it's like back to real life today or whatever, you know, <laughs> there, there's yeah. a continuation that's going to happen there with some cool projects, but it still all blends into one. Don't dwell on your wins, but also don't just blow over them. You know, that that's something yeah. that I've learned, you know, so it's not it's no problem to hang out where you're at if that's what you want to do. You know, and that's an active choice. You can have a great family. You can have a great career. You can provide for everybody, have a, have a retirement, you know, if that's where you want to be. And that's a personal choice. You know, it's just like whether you're going to vote Republican or Democrat, it's a personal choice that nobody can fault you for. Mm -hmm. Nobody. You know, but for me, it's just like built into me that if you, it, it, I guess it becomes a problem when you see somebody else and be like, well, why couldn't I do that? Or that person is lucky. I hear that all the time. Rick's just so freaking lucky, right? I'm like, are you kidding me? What happened yeah. this week was like six years in the making because of things I've done. Well, I, I wouldn't have been there. Takes a lot of years to be overnight tease, success. I tease almost every single one of our guests that's achieved a level of success. I'm like, you just, you're just an addict. You know that, right? Yeah, like, I mean, that's a, yes. that's such an ugly word, right? But like, <laughs> whether it's a success addict or a, you know, like, yeah. and with anything, I'm sure you've had a lot of loved ones in your life, you know, that are at maybe not a lot, but at least a few along the way that are like, 
the, like what you just said about appreciating yeah. your, your victories, right? That pains them more than it does you when you're just it like, does. okay, what's next? Right. And yeah, they're like, right man, I was with you for the six months while you prepped for that and you were yeah. miserable and we just did it. And now you're not even going to like say anything, any, any yeah. sort of celebration for that. Like you're driven, but geez, man, like, Take a minute. Bathe in it for Have a little bit. Enjoy yeah. it. Yeah. Like. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Th that's been, uh, even just this year, that's something that I've had to make a conscious shift on is yeah. celebrating the wins, you know, and even not just necessarily for my sake, it's for everybody else that's around me that's helped achieve those. I, I don't know. It's a, I'm getting vulnerable on you right now too, because it, it, I've always been that what's next guy. You know, yeah, because yeah. A, to me, there's always more to do. There's always a, another rung on that ladder to keep going, going up and, and climb and, and whatever we're going after. So it's like pushing, 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 pushing. Yeah. But there's got to be a moment to where you can just coast. And when I say a moment, I truly do mean a moment because yeah, you don't want to dwell on that. Because I mean, I, dude, I, I lost 80 pounds seven years ago, right? Everybody else loves hearing that story too, because now it's the story for everybody else around me. I hate hearing it. I hate telling it because really? it's like, well, that's okay. what I, that's what I did. You know, yeah. it's not what I'm doing right now. It's what I did. You know, yeah. it taught me a lot. Yes. But it's like, that was a huge win for me, but I hate going back to that. But now I see along the same lines that now that story, it's not for my benefit to tell it. It's for everybody mm -hmm. else to hear it. So sure. I have to keep telling it. So everyone else can be encouraged and uplifted. Just like that. That's a, don't blow over the winds. I mean, even if you have to keep telling the same freaking story for 20 years, there's always going to be another person that you can touch with it. Somebody out there is going to grasp yeah. it. Can I ask Rick? I mean, you've got a couple 10 or 12 year old. I mean, those. Yeah. My 13 year old, old girls, 13. Wow. 13, I mean, talk yeah. about they probably make you uh, step out of this version of life once in a while, at least. I mean, can you talk yeah, a little they, bit they about do, man? I mean, when I got home today, because I stopped at home before coming to the studio and dude, I always get the biggest welcome from them. Having twins is so cool. It's boy, girl, twins. And then I have a younger son. So my twins oh my are 13 and my son is 10. And okay. dude, it's, it's always awesome seeing them. And now I'm, I'm injecting them. You know, I, I use the phrase integration because I think work-life balance is pretty stupid. You know, it's a, a it's tough. It, even, it's tough. It, it is, yeah. <laughs> it's hard to draw I, I, those lines. It is. Even if you're working like a nine to five job, the typical, you know, it's like, well, what are the, what's the reason you're working for? You know, <laughs> how do you separate that? Even yeah. if you have, you know, a, a tough day or whatever it is, the whole reason you're doing that is to pro provide for your family or your life or wh whatever it is. And then reciprocating that, you know, it has to be one thing, you know, it, whatever. I mean, if you want it, that's fine. I, I don't get that. I was never that dude, you know, mm -hmm. the, but my twins, man, they, they do help ground me. My son, my youngest son, he does help ground me into things, you know, but at the same time, I, I try to pull them up out of norm normalcy just to say hey you you don't have to be like every other kid that's out there you know you, you don't yeah. have to i mean even to the point where they're not in the public school system not because of covid we did that you know about six months before covid hit to, just because okay. i wanted them to be on an accelerated pace because you know, i mean public gotcha. school system we're not going to dive into that rabbit hole today because you know, everyone knows how, how that is you know I, I love teachers appreciate them as long as they're truly trying to teach you know the side note i believe in incentive pay for teachers too i'm just saying you know because if if the whole class gets an a i think the teacher should be paid more bottom line because that means all that teachers job, are not right? created equal yeah exactly <laughs> yeah but if the whole class fails i mean they get paid the same amount ah, you know that's maybe it's the business side of me i don't know I don't know, but no, like, there's usually there's usually a, 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 a there's usually some sort of leveling of that. I agree. It kind of uh, I hate to say it's somewhat related to that earlier conversation we had about yeah a little bit. You got police it. regulation, like these yeah, professionals sure. that we count on. It'd be nice. Right He's certainly comparing those two budgets. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah let's funding, do that. Defunding one, you should be. Comparing oh, there you go. The other, exactly. Like, yeah, the, the, the teachers are so really underpaid yeah. too. And that's probably part of the reason why it's you not know, just the salary, right? It's the investment it, into the system. Itself. Yeah, right on, right on. That's a good, that's a fantastic point. I uh, I don't know what the solution is there, but still, yeah. I want to ask you a question though, yeah. like because none of us have the solution for that one. But I bet you have a really healthy solution for this, or you know, I'm sure I'm sure your wife's awesome. Just from talking to you, she's amazing. So like, yeah. 
<laughs> How do you keep that balance, <laughs> especially as those kids become teenagers and you kind of move like into that worldly part of your life, right? Like, yeah. how do you keep that balance that you mentioned earlier where you said like, you got to kind of, you got to kind of want a little bit all the time. You got to push yourself into uncomfort. Yeah. How, do, do you care to comment on that? Yeah, man. I, first I inject my kids into my life. I bring them with me and I let okay. them see me when I'm uncomfortable okay. too. Yeah. You know, I let okay. them see me in those growth moments to where it's like, man, I, I'm a little nervous. And my, my son, my oldest son, I remember the first time I told him, I was like, dad, you're nervous. It's like, yeah. I see you like at, at NASDAQ. I see you on TV all the time. You know, and you're, you're nervous. I'm like, yeah, man. I'm like, this is like another thing. You know, it's, a, it's always that yeah. case. You know, and if you're not a little uncomfortable, if you're not a little nervous, then what's the point of doing it? Because you're Probably not going to get care anything enough. out of it. Yeah. Exactly. Yep. So always push yourself to that point. It's really cool, man, to see them at these points. Because my, my daughter wants to open like a franchise of bakeries and she's 13. Dude, every, it used to be every time I would come home from traveling, man, there'd be like three new cakes that are there. Okay. It's like, it's like, <laughs> I already lost the weight. Okay. And they're good too. They're crazy good. And this isn't like bias that. because there's been times cause she experiments. I'm like, yeah, this wasn't very good. I'll tell her, you know? <laughs> <laughs> but, okay. but then she'll be like, all right, then I'm not going to do that. Or, I'll, or she'll be like, yeah, I know where I messed up dad. <laughs> so you're honest <laughs> with them. That's, exactly. that's the moral of that yeah. story, right? You're just transparent. Like it right just on. Works. Yeah. She's like, I forgot the sugar. I'm like, then why did you give it to me to try? Why yeah, you, you knew that, that was you know? going to suck. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and then it's just a big laugh, you know, but she, it was just like, whatever. But mm. she wants to do that. And she's striving for that. My oldest son, you know, he's looking at filmmaking and everything else because ma- I've made three documentaries now. We're in the process of making the third one. And it's he just sees a lot of the stuff that I do. My youngest, he is so much like me because he's very much getting into martial arts now. And it's his thing, but he sees my discipline in that. And that's an outlet for him to do the same exact thing. And now, I mean, he's only 10, you know, he's like four belts in. I don't even know what belt color he is. I forgot about this. I don't know the hierarchy. Yeah. I just found out today that now he's starting to teach some of the younger belts too. Oh, cool. Because they're calling him to do that. I'm like, dude, the last step in learning is teaching. He's like, I never thought of it that way. That's pretty cool. I'm like, exactly. That's how it's going to get ingrained in your head now. Right on, right on. So it's really cool to see them dive into their own interests, but encourage those and be honest and transparent with them along the way. Dude, I hate the phrase. I was told this when I was on. It's like, oh, you can be anything you want to be. No, you can't. <laughs> it, you don't have the skill set. I don't have the skill set to be like an astronaut. Okay. I don't have the yeah. skill set to, to be a carpenter. You know, could I, could I hang a door? Maybe it might not close. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right yeah. If I try to do that, I understand the process. So I can see if it's not shut right. I'm like, oh, maybe it needs another shim over there or something like that. I need to call a carpenter to do it (laughs) because I'm not going to be able to do it right. I remember my dad just being like, and it wasn't, it wasn't a, a mean thing. And it wasn't like, son, sit down. I need to talk to you. But like, I was obsessed with sports as a kid, but my dad would regularly as a matter of fact, he would never praise me for any of my achievements on any field ever. And he would oh, regularly, man. you know, no, 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 don't get me wrong. The thing is, is my dad, like I, I excelled in the classroom as well. So my dad yeah. was my biggest fan in the world. He just, he wanted me to know that, like, enjoy sports while they last. But this <laughs> isn't, this isn't going to be the end all be all for you. Yeah, this isn't sure. going to be your life. Yeah. And, and it wasn't like a it sounds discouraging, right? But it was more so encouragement to like, even at a young age, Michael, I want you to keep your focus on the classroom because you're going to be using that when you're 19. You're going to be using that when you're 20. You're going to be using that for the rest of your life. You know what I mean? So I kind of grew up with the same like, I see these posters on your wall. You ain't going to be a basketball player. You know that. Like, you know, and I actually grew like five (laughs) inches taller than my dad. I think he was just, yeah. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. And you know, when COVID hits, son, nobody's going to be playing ball anyway. Yeah, so. exactly. <laughs> Come to not, think of it, he was ahead of his game. He was ahead yep, of his you got game. it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Lord. Man. What I, now? I was, we, oh, well, yeah. I'll be honest, Rick. It's hard to, uh, we covered a pretty wide range of things yeah, here today. And yeah. there's a question that we often discuss with our guests, but I feel like we've already gone there. Um, today. And it's, it's basically, we, we want you to, if there's any real good advice you could, you could give the teenage you, um, 
you know, and I'm sorry to hear that the 15 year old you was going through what you were going through. But like, do, do, is there anything additional you think you could add on that that you haven't already shared with us? Today? Dude, the, the only if I were to call it a regret or maybe like wisdom in hindsight that I look mm-hmm. at because I, I had the opportunity to dive into the entrepreneurial space six years before I did. You know, but, you know I, okay. I had that comfy paycheck coming in you know, and it, it really has nothing to do with with money or, or whatever, you know, finding a career. But it, it, the advice that I would always give myself is just go out and do things. Just just try whatever you have in your head, you know, because you think of the safety nets, you know, and I even think of when, you know, one of like my biggest first fights with my wife was about the timing on kids. You know, and I kept saying, I want all of our ducks to be in a row. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. You're a planner. You know, exactly. And I'm like, who, who cares? Now I realize it's like, who cares? You can always make money. Always. Yeah. You know, that's, I didn't know that then I do now, but to my teenage son or anybody out there, you can always make money. There's a hundred ways to do that. I even had the conversation with my son this morning. He was talking about, yeah, I just spent all my money. Cause a dude like, I mean, he works for me sometimes or he'll do stuff around the house. He's a, this is my 13 year old. I mean, he'll go pull weeds and be like, yeah, I'll go work outside for a few hours for 15 bucks an hour. Heck yeah. You know, that, that's awesome. Right. He's like, dad, I'm broke now. I just, you know, bought some more stuff on Amazon. I'm like, well, you can always make more. He's like, more yeah, no, dude, yeah. Don't worry. <laughs> exactly. And I'm like, you know, even a thousand dollars is pretty easy to make it. He just laughs at 30. He's like, yeah, yeah, it is. <laughs> and he's 13, right? Yeah, no, that's- he understands that now. And if that's something that I had that I could have had my dad instill in me is that you can, money should not be a struggle. Money should just be a tool. Comes that's and goes. The, the, exactly. You know, yeah. and as long as you have it, use it, use it to help other people. The more you're going to continue to use that, but you can always make more money. So just go out and try things, you know, don't lock yourself into one thing when you're 18, mm-hmm. when you're 20, when you're 25 during that period, just try everything you possibly can. And uh, looking back, I kind of did with, you know, my resume that I have, sure, you know, sure. un- unknowing what I was actually doing, but well, now out of everything, necessity, right? Yeah. Out of exactly, necessity it was, for you. Right on. Thank well, you God. just keep your legs moving. It sounds like it sounds yeah. like you know one of the things that you were able to do. And unfortunately, we're here like towards the end, right? You know, this sounds like it could be like a Rogan length podcast. And we really vibe <laughs> well together. I hope we can reach back out and get you to come on some of our expert episodes. Yeah, um, man. But like ultimately, man, like what you're talking about there is that just like it's keep your legs moving. Right. Right Like just keep your legs moving and keep them moving with earnesty, right? Like keep moving them because you want to move your legs, not just because like the, there's a pot of gold at the end of the the tunnel. There's, you know, I, we, I could string together 10 cliches, which I'm not going to waste another 30 seconds with, right? Like just keep your legs moving because that's what humans do, right? Like just keep it working. So for sure, listen, Rick, if I want to, there's two things I want to ask. One, is there anything you're promoting right now, right? Because it's something that we always want to make sure that we give a, a thing I for. I appreciate like, you asking that. Yeah, secondarily, man. Secondarily, like, how do I follow you? Like, cl- close yeah. us down here. We'll give, <laughs> we'll, we'll, in post script, we'll do the convention, not podcast thing and all that kind of yeah, stuff. But like, yeah. let's get on to our evenings. You got a family to get back to. Let's, drop let's, it. Let's when you're it. done, Rick, go ahead and drop yeah. it. Yeah. But give it, give us your yeah. outro. <laughs> yeah. You got it. Uh, at Mr. Rick Jordan on any platform. Instagram's really the best. You know, I started building that just a couple months ago, which is great. But what I'm promoting right now is Liberty Lockdown. That's the documentary that I'm currently filming. It's about huh. government overreach, and it has nothing to do with you know pro mask against mask, nothing like that. It's just strictly was it legal for okay. for all the governors, all the officials to do that? It's an interesting perspective, man, and oh, it's shit. a lot of like real life stories from people that we've done you know human interest stories on this. You know, people that were shut down or bullied by the government to shut down. It just crazy, man. It's, it's interesting, you know, just want to get the truth out there and have people start asking questions for themselves instead of being fed by the media. Oh, are they man. going to stop inviting you to the White House soon, Rick? Yeah, dude. <laughs> yeah. I love hey, it, whatever. man. I yeah. love it. Hey, I don't stand on one side of the aisle either, Rick. And I, <laughs> I applaud anybody that can that can shake both hands. You know what I yep. mean? Like, I really I do. Mean, I think... Dude, I just uh, care for, care about truth. That's it. You know, that it's... Well, an innovation that, is built in moderacy, guys. Yeah. Like, it really... It, it, there's no other thing, you know? I mean, even if we yep. need to paint the White House as purple as your jacket, which I love that jacket you have we'll on today, it. for our yeah. listeners that look into the, <laughs> the media images, right? You're, listen, you're listening on podcast. You got to see this great jacket that he's got on. It's, it's phenomenal, man. But, Thanks, man. like, seriously, like, if we need to make these monumental changes, we couldn't imagine yeah. that I'm not 
suggesting that we deface the White House. But yeah. what I am saying is that like, if this is what we need to change, then like, this is like modest and moderacy is what yeah. inspires change, right? It's not yeah. the edges that inspire that change. You got so, it. Man, really, really appreciate your time. Dude, I'm so um, great the, being on. Thank you. The, the documentary again is what and which platforms will we be able to find it when it comes? At first, it's released independently just at libertylockdown.com. It will okay. be on Amazon later this year. Okay. Get it independently, guys. Get it independently. Yep. Support this guy independently. We don't need to go into that. We talk about that in other episodes about supporting you independent want to try artists. to get it into um, Sundance before we put it on any major platforms. So. <laughs> that's cool. I look forward to following up uh, with you about that journey because that's a whole other journey, right? You know, I mean, it is. and that's yeah. really cool. So really yeah. appreciate your time today. Um, we're at Thank convention, you. not. Thanks again. <laughs>